and I, I really tried to give it its due, but in the end, I judge that it fails to defeat the prima facie obvious appearance that animals do suffer in morally significant ways. In your view, animals, or at least, uh, at least some animals, I'm not sure if we, we have to say that fleas are conscious, yeah. conscious, for instance, but anyway, at least all the higher animals and who knows exactly where it stops, someday will also be resurrected and they will also have their capacities enhanced by God to where they can actually see and appreciate the value of their suffering and just you know form a judgment, yeah, that was worth it. Is that accurate enough? That's right. Well, two things. First, the, animal pro the problem of animal pain is raised frequently among my atheist and unbelieving friends. It's raised more frequently than the problem of human suffering. And the reason, I think, is that for human suffering, there are at least some pretty good common sense strategies for reasoning to, you know, what's going on here. One, one of the biggest ones having to do with free will, character development. And it was just, it was just assumed without argument that nothing like this, nothing in any way like this could apply to animals. So what I argue in the book is that in a way it shouldn't be that surprising if or it would be surprising if humans were the only creatures whom God enhanced their capabilities. And one of, the, one of the motivations for theosis, for deification in the Eastern tradition was the hypostatic union, the, the union of the divine nature uh, with the, the human nature of Jesus. So there was this thought that because of that, because of that union, all humans who participate in human nature will be brought up somewhat into the divine nature. But the same fathers who talk about the deification as being motivated by the hypostatic union because the human nature is taken up into the divine nature also talk about ways in which all of creation is taken up into the divine nature and united to God. And then I sort of try to show that the very same motivations for human theosis apply to animal theosis, the creation in general. For the, um, for the animals that one eats, I, I think those are different well, it depends on, you know, the, the cruelty that went into that. I, th I think the concern for me wouldn't be just the eating. We, we tend to respect the Native American or the tribal person who, who kills an animal to feed the village and then thanks the animal for giving that sacrifice. And I got to say, you know, I mean, if there are taboos against human, you know, cam cannibalism for, for reasons that we can, we can make sense of, but, you know, I mean, if there was a remote plane crash, that I would, I would be happy that my body fed fed people and kept them alive. So there's, there are issues there, obviously. But I do think that the concern for me wouldn't just wouldn't be the, the eating part. It would be, how did I contribute to a system where they experienced unnecessary and unjust suffering in those cases? So a lot of your book, you are, in a way, kind of tearing down philosophical barriers to people accepting this. One of them is the idea that animals don't have souls. But yeah, why not? If you believe in souls for humans, why couldn't at least higher animals also have souls? Mm -hmm. And uh, even you argue that even if they don't have souls, well, still they could still be the same being that's resurrected. You, you argue that that's possible. Mm -hmm. So first, there's some interesting research on our ability to interpret the mental lives of animals. So the cognitive scientists call, call this the ability to project thoughts and mental states onto other beings, a theory of mind. And so there are many instances that are pretty well documented where a human's ability to perceive the, the character and, and mental life of certain animals is obscured by the fact that some animals express their, their selves in ways that are very understandable to humans and in others not. So I do think that one has to be really careful about these judgments for these reasons. The main issue for me is just whether, and so pain is intrinsically bad, I say, and, and then so that's step one. Step two is that these animals have experienced morally significant pain. And then step three is because God is good in the way that God is good, each and every instance of badness which includes every, each and every instance of pain, pain being intrinsically bad, has to be compensated for in some way. Now, it could be that some animals' lives are good enough on balance that they don't stand in need of compensation. 
and maybe God doesn't resurrect them. But others do. So to me, it's, it's very much driven morally. So even if it were the case that they were kind of all of a piece, um, that wouldn't stop me from, from having the moral motivations that I have to think that their, their suffering has to be compensated for. Now, I argue in the book for an expansion of the idea of the Imago Dei to animals. I argue that humans are in the image of God in a very special sort of way, but that the very same things that uh, lead us to think of humans as being in the image of God are true just to, to lesser degrees of all conscious beings. In fact, all living beings are in, in some sense made in the image of God. So I, so I argue that we need to think of this in, in a sliding scale. And I argue that any conscious being uh, or any being capable of suffering pain to a certain degree has moral standing, has standing in the moral, moral realm, and by which I just mean God has a reason to prevent their suffering. I don't argue that animals have rights, but I do argue that they have moral standing. Now, one of the really interesting things in this book is that you try to turn around the issue of evil on the atheists. Yeah. And some people are will grant the point that, okay, it could be that God exists and there is just some evil of some kind. Okay, fine. But, come on, there's surely just way too much evil and uh, too many rotten kinds of evil out there. And you don't prove of this too much evil idea. Why not? But I think that speaks to our limited cognitive capacities. Lewis points out that there's no one who suffers the sum total of pain and that God's dealings are with individuals and that I'm, I'm, I've even come to doubt somewhat that there's any sensible way to talk about the value of a world, to talk about aggregates. God loves each person and that hypothesis has to be born out in each person's life. And so that just makes the too much suffering thing a, a mistake. You're saying uh, too much for what? Because if the end is saint, what you call saint making, then uh, hey, it looks like maybe it's just about the right amount. Yeah, and this is something that I mean, like Lewis said in the problem of pain, it's he jests at scars who never felt a wound, and I just haven't had the kind of suffering that bothers me. I have, an, I have not experienced the kind of suffering that I think is the really problematic kind of suffering. So that needs to be acknowledged. However, the fact is most of the people I know who have suffered in these horrific ways don't end up less confident that God exists. They end up more confident that God exists. And we don't live in a world where every person suffers soul-crushing defeat. If we were in such a world, I would take that to be nearly conclusive evidence that there wasn't a God. But on the other hand, I honestly think that a, a, a sort of a world of, of delights would not suggest to me the existence of God because I would think, this is, if there's a God, he wants something more than this. This is just, you know, we got into some kind of lucky universe. We just sort of won the cosmic lottery. So I do think that there are degrees of suffering or world ensembles that, that include ranges of suffering that don't fit nearly as well with theism as the current range does. And even though that doesn't narrow things very much, it narrows it much more than naturalism. And so if you're using a Bayesian method and the Bayes factor method, then it's about the ratio. It doesn't need to be, it doesn't, you don't need to have a situation where, gosh, theism makes this likely. In fact, it could be fairly surprising on theism. But if it's fairly surprising on theism and very, very surprising indeed on atheism, then the data actually in that case confirm theism. And I don't think this has been recognized enough that it's really is this, this sort of, it came as a revelation to me as I was just thinking through these issues and structurally, if, if the distribution and magnitude, the data concerning the distribution and magnitude of evil are run through a Bayesian filter and we think about what we would actually expect from God, then it's, it's as likely to me that they confirm theism as that they disconfirm it. The view is not that God causes or brings about, facilitates 
or even probabilifies any specific instance of suffering. Rather, the idea is that in making a world ensemble, for there to be a human drama to be played out, we would not expect God to create a world that did not give people the scope of morally significant freedom that we find. A world that did not have scope for that kind of freedom, scope for that kind of virtue, and the vices that go along with them, that is not the kind of world that I would expect a perfect God to create, because I would expect a perfect God to be most interested in the highest values. The idea is that here is a world of a wide range of beings with a wide range of abilities and powers, and, and it is just part of that is the possibility for these things. So I just want to make it perfectly clear that none of the, I, 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 I would be appalled by anyone who said that the Holocaust was something that God brought about in order to bring about the greater good of the virtues or whatever. It just I find that morally repugnant. Bringing about a world in which that sort of thing can happen occasionally is more what, what he intended. The, the conjunction of the the goods and the and the evils that that are likely to go along with them is better than the absence of both that's sort of the bottom line so many times when people are having a visceral reaction to evil and uh, and start objecting to belief in god on the basis of evil i kind of wonder if people are just thinking well i wouldn't do it that way mm -hmm. yeah well you're look you're a nice guy mm -hmm. you don't want to hurt anybody you want to just get along but, I mean, I think God would say, son, you don't know what it's like being God. The way in which an entire universe is, is, is a complex entity, the, the, the goods and bads and intricacies of which are going to be complicated. And this is sort of the truth in the sort of low-grade common sense skeptical theism of not being super confident that you would be able to do it right. Peter Van Inwigen is really good about pressing people on these things. Now, he has too high a standard. He basically says to object to the way God made the world, you kind of have to actually have a, a working model. You know, you, like you have to like write down some laws of physics. Uh, he, that's a little much. But, you know, there's, the, the point's well taken. You'd have to really put some time and effort into thinking about how a world would be better to be really confident that the world isn't as uh, the, the kind of world that we would expect from God.